study about a new sex chromosome system uh, that we've found in blood frogs. I'm from McMaster, we're a big fan of the blood. So, sex chromosomes, prior here, control sexual development of these souls, how the master regulators. Um, and there can be dominant systems, dose dependent systems, other systems that people necessarily refer to as specific. Uh, these systems can have, say, one gene, dual sex, or a dose imbalance between males and females. You can have female specific systems with a W chromosome, male specific systems with a Y chromosome. And we know about a fair bit of diversity in terms of what is the master regulator uh, across vertebrates. So, in frogs, we know a gene called DMW. In fish, we know a couple different genes. Mammals, so Y, birds, same white forms. If we look at specific groups, we can see quite a variety in uh, Y and the W systems. What is sex linked? What is the master regulator? With lizards and snakes, we get a similar story. So, in here, uh, color reflects the W or XY system. There's quite a bit of variety in this group. And the story holds for amphibians as well. Again, color here reflecting XY systems and ZW systems. So there seems to be quite a lot of change, quite a lot of turnover of what is the sex chromosome in these groups. But despite this diversity, there's, there's some similar players that seem to keep cropping up over and over. And I suggest there's maybe a little bit of ascertainment bias. We kind of look for things we know to look for. Um, but there's a lot of homologous genes, so these DM domain containing genes, DMW, DMRC1, DMY, the SOX domain genes, SRY, SOX3, a lot of them are potentially uh, transcription factor families, that good thing. And um, there's a lot of homologous sex linked regions, so the platypus, the bird, a species of gecko seem to have similar sex linked regions, mammal, frog, lizard, fish. And the question becomes why? Why do we see these similarities? Well, in some cases, it's certainly shared ancestry. But there's also this idea of limited options. Perhaps there's only certain things that can be the sex chromosomes and can control sexual development. And it leads to this idea of a recycling of genetic elements where you get the same thing showing up over and over again, independently in different lineages. So we study African clod frogs. There's 29 species in the group currently. They've undergone numerous genome duplications. We have up to dodecaploid species in this group. They all seem to have homomorphic sex chromosomes, so these are the cytologically indistinguishable sex chromosomes we just heard about. And um, from what we can tell, all of them have ZWZZ systems, which have female specific chromosomes. And in a lot of these frogs, DMW is the master regulator, so it's a female determining gene, it's on the W chromosome, and it basically functions to stop DMRT1 from turning on male genes. And we've got DMRT1 genes everywhere. And it's present in a wide variety of xenophors. So this is just a simplified look at the phylogeny uh, with taxa representing major lineages. These are the taxa that um, I knew when I worked on. So DMW is present <coughs> in a number of them, but it is not in the Borealis lineage or its close relatives. You can see there's some phylogenetic uncertainty in um, this place. So given that uncertainty, my objective is by the evolutionary history of DMW and try and find out what is this sex determining region in Borealis and its close relatives. A couple possibilities. Uh, currently, autosomal analyses seem to support this story where we have DMW gained early on and then lost specifically in the Borealis lineage. Mitochondria analysis suggests that the DMW containing clade is monophyletic and that it was just gained once in the Borealis lineage and never had it. So since it's this clivy branch here that's kind of bouncing around and uncertain, we first wanted to confirm that DMW was probably still the master regulator in that clade. So we amplified it with, um, in some males and some females, and uh, we have a positive control here, just mitochondria, and we can see that DMW pops up in most of the females that we tried, and importantly, none of the males. We've done more individuals. This was just a pretty picture. So perhaps it's still the master regulator in this group. Moving on to phylogenetics, tetraploids pose some interesting challenges. So in the Xenophis clade, at some point, uh, we have a diploid ancestor speciated. We think it underwent an allopolyploidization event where two species bred and their genome complements were retained, creating tetraploid lineages. 
and then those species. And so these particular taxa that I work with are tetraploids. They're not the octoploids, they're not the dodecaploids. So now, for any given gene, we actually have a reflected phylogeny where you have two sets of orthologs, which come from the speciation events, and a set of homeologs, which is the result of the duplication event earlier on. So you can think of these as alpha and beta, or in the lingo of the Xenopus genome, uh, the L subgenome and the S subgenome. And if you want to know anything about species relationships, you have to ensure that you are comparing orthologs and not homeologs. So to simplify the problem a little bit, we've got three taxa here, A, B, and C, and they have their alpha lineage and their beta lineage. And ideally, we would have all the data, and we would just know. But in reality, we have missing data, as signified by these gray lineages here. And if you don't know what data is missing, and if you can't tell what your sets of orthologs are, you're going to make the wrong inference that A and C are most closely related, and B was quite distantly diverged. So what you need is to restrict your data set to uh, alignments where you have at least one homeologous sequence, so this B sequence here, for at least one species. And that allows you to figure out what are your orthologs, what are your homeologs. So that's what we did. We did multiple rounds of tree building and parsing these relationships to try and sort out what are orthologs and what are homeologs, and kind of assuming this minimum topology of two deeply diverged lineages, but nothing about the species relationships within those ones. So we started with some unigene databases for the well-studied species, Tropicalis and Labus, and some transcriptome data sets for everybody else. We end up with about 1,585 sets of homologs, genes, all of them had at least 300 base pairs of one-gap data. At least three in-group taxa plus that critical homeologous sequence. We have some reduced data sets where we have a lot less missing data. There was a fair degree of data in that whole data set. And we did some mitochondrial analyses too. Some of these guys have genome sequences. Other ones, we just pulled mitochondria out of the transcriptome data sets. For the most part, no matter what we do, we end up with this sort of a phylogeny where we have um, Oyal's sister to the Clindy plate, suggesting that DMW was gained early on and then lost specifically in this lineage. There's a curious case going on with the mitochondria where if you set a strict clock, it results as a monophyletic plate DMW, and if you set a relaxed clock, it results as this tree. Um, that is the only change. But anyway, so the phylogenetics and some previous work suggests that there's been a loss of DMW in this Borealis lineage. Borealis lineage. And we can't amplify DMW in Borealis as much as we try. But how about a gene linked to DMW? So we made a family of Borealis and another family of Labus in the lab, and we're going to track how parental heterozygous sites are inherited from the parent's offspring. There's sex bias inheritance, sex linkage of a gene. So here we have the parents and our offspring. The parents, one parent may be homozygous, the other parent may be heterozygous at a particular site in the gene, right? If it's um, sex bias in, that, in the offspring, the genotype beta, so you have sex linkage. If not, it's not resolved. So the gene in question was RAB6A, and we can show that in Labus, which has DMW, um, RAB6A shows sex linkage, as we would expect. But in Borealis, neither of the homeologs show any sex bias in their inheritance. So again, suggesting that what is sex linked in the DMW containing species, namely Xenopus labus, is not sex linked in Xenopus borealis. What is? Well, we do some GBS sequencing on that family that I talked about, the Boyalis family. We did it parents redundantly to try and minimize missing data. And we looked for completely sex linked tags. So these were tags that were covered by 90% of our offspring females with all one genotype and males with all another genotype. We blasted those into the latest genome and then aligned those scaffolds to Tropicalis. The reason for that was because GBS tags were kind of short. And we wanted to establish homology among taxa. So six of the ten tags that had hits, six of the ten sex-linked tags that had hits to the latest genome um, aligned to Tropicalis chromosome 8. So we grab a couple of genes, interesting ones, that happen to be on Tropicalis chromosome 8 to support this result, that this is the homolog of uh, Borealis's sex chromosome. And what we can show is that all three of those genes so very strong sex linkage in our family. Again, this is minus G as such. We then went back and we aligned all of the tags to the latest genome. We had about 75% mapping using 
GW radiation variant calling the GW genome and then some. But something to keep in mind is that the latest genome is fairly diverged, as I showed you in the phylogeny earlier, and it's rather repetitive for a big frog genome. And then we map sex linkage, again, as this sex-biased genotype in the offspring. So now we're not just going to look at 100% sex linked tags, but uh, sex linkage of all the tags. And there could be none, or it could be one. And we did this for tags that had 80% coverage in their offspring, just to increase the number of it. So I'm going to show you some graphs in a second. And the way the value works, or the y-axis will work, is that if a tag has a genotype that's overrepresented in daughters, it's going to be above zero. And if it has equal frequency in the offspring, it's going to be zero. Surprise, surprise, chromosome 8L has the most sex linked tags. So L, again, is just one of the latest subgenome chromosomes, one of those that's more homologous. And it's homologous to Tropical's chromosome 8. Thankfully, a new paper came out and was like, hey, let's call everything 8. So if we look at a couple autosomes here, what we can see is that this sex bias in the genotype floats pretty much around zero as we would expect. There shouldn't be any sex linkage in the autosome. So here's chromosome 2L, chromosome 2S, it's homeolog, all around zero, chromosome 7L, chromosome 7S, all around zero. When we take a look at chromosome 8 and its homeolog 8S, we can see that for a fair bit of the chromosome, there's quite strong sex linkage, quite strong sex bias in these genotypes in the offspring, with a few curious exceptions. And in chromosome 8L, it, or 8S, my apologies, it floats pretty much around zero, as you would expect, with one kind of funny point there. Investigating further, um, the likely cause of this, I bet it's just mismapping. Um, again, diverged genome. So this leaves us with at least three sex determining systems in the Xenopus genus. One in Tropicalis, um, which is a really curious system with ZW and a, and a Y chromosome floating around in there. And it's on uh, chromosome seven. We have Xenopus latus with DMW, it's on chromosome two. And now we have Xenopus borealis with something else sitting on chromosome eight, oh, specifically. Where I I think that this kind of gets quite interesting, gets back to this recycling idea, is when you put this in a tree of some other amphibians. What we can see is that the same systems, say in Borealis, appear elsewhere with similar sex-linked genes. We have the Tropicalis system popping up down here, suggesting again this independent evolution of the same regions over and over again. Um, yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab, Brian Goldie, for taking all my computational abuse, some funding, some great communities, um, our community, I love you all. <laughs>